A millionaire with no children came up with an unusual strategy to choose an heir for his business. He convinced his lawyer to dress up as a poor man and go talk to his employees to find out who should take over the company. But unfortunately, he was not prepared for what he was about to discover. When Mr. Harry Melville looked in the mirror that Monday morning, shaving cream in hand, he realized how quickly time had passed. He had been working for 40 years and had a head full of white hair, sunken eyes, and wrinkles across his face. His reflection made him think that maybe it was time to slow down the pace of life even more and finally think about what his legacy would be. Harry was 75 years old, lucid, and very active. He loved to talk and walk, but now he realized he wouldn't live forever and someone had to take over and run his six supermarkets. So he finished shaving, put on a suit, perfumed himself, and left. He was going to speak with his lawyer immediately. Harry Melville ran a respectable supermarket chain. The company was very profitable, and he could easily open more units if he wanted to. Despite his advanced age, he was a well-maintained gentleman. He ate a balanced diet of natural products and drank plenty of water. He didn't go to parties or fancy places in town, but he liked to show off his charm at work. He always dressed up for meetings with suppliers or his management team. When these meetings were held outside the office, he would drive up in a classic car from the 1970s that had been carefully maintained. Even though he had enough money to buy the newest convertible, he put his faith in an old car that, like him, was in great shape. He was a man who lived alone and ran his supermarket chain by himself. He was known to be generous to his employees, even if he wasn't always available. His quirks gave him a reputation as a somewhat eccentric man. He didn't have a wife, children, or anything resembling a family. He only had his peculiar ways in six supermarkets. He achieved everything through hard work, trial and error, and reinvesting his earnings since he opened his first small grocery store next to a gas station when he was only 35 years old into his own business. It was a daring and forward-thinking move. When everyone else said that the region had no growth potential, he saw it for what it was. After the company grew and got more units, other business people offered Harry a franchise plan, but he turned them down. He said he preferred to stick with the stores that he could run himself, an attitude that contributed further to his image as an eccentric man, also in the business world. Before looking for an heir for his business, Harry Melville decided to pay a visit to his lawyer, Watson Goldstein. Goldstein was used to his client's eccentricities, like showing up at his office late at night, but the lawyer had yet to learn what his client would ask for this time. My problem is the future, my friend the businessman said, explaining how hard it was for him to find someone to take over. Goldstein first suggested that the entire business be donated to charity. Imagine the leap in popularity you'd gain, said the lawyer. Harry had lived long enough to know that a charity could not always handle such a complex business. He even heard about a charity that got a business from a millionaire and hired people to run it. Ultimately, the administrators kept the profits that should have belonged to the charity. Harry shivered at the thought of this possibility, so he dismissed the idea. Goldstein knew his client and friend didn't have any close family, but he wanted to confirm. Excuse me, my dear fellow, the old man said. You know I grew up in an orphanage. It was true. Harry Melville had been sent to an orphanage when he was three years old, and no one knew anything about his real family. He moved from one foster home when he was five to another when he was nine. In the end, he couldn't stay with either family. At 16, he got his first job through a program for low-income teens and young adults. During this time, he started to learn how to deal with people and how to negotiate. After a few years, he became the manager of a gas station. He lived alone in a small apartment, and his salary was enough to pay the bills and buy a popular car. There was an empty office building next to the gas station. Harry had always thought that keeping this place closed and falling apart was a waste of space and time. So he made a deal with his boss, who owned the gas station, that he would fix it up and turn it into a convenience store. The owner of the building would get 30% of the money made. Harry would get the rest. It took the clever orphan a year and a half to figure out how to open the store. Harry bought the building from his old boss with all the money he made in the first two years of business. After a year, the gas station had become a small market. And so it was, constantly reinvesting capital that Harry managed to get to where he is now. Finally, he told the lawyer that, besides not having any family, he preferred to leave his company to someone who understood the struggle he had to go through alone to have a business like that. The lawyer was running out of options, recognizing that this was a challenging case since his client was not a man who thought or lived like the other business people he knew. It was then that Goldstein made a comment that activated Harry's imagination. I know it is difficult for you to know all your employees, but these supermarkets are your life, aren't they? What if a person who already works for you were a candidate? 
someone who cares for it as much as you do. Harry clapped his hands and stood up excitedly. Although he doubted that anyone would care for the company as much as himself, he said that Watson had given him a great idea. He would select his successor based on character. After all, to him, a person's character was far more important than the resume or the origin of the blood that would run in the veins of his chosen one. You are the perfect man for this task, Watson, Harry said. The lawyer was confused for a few seconds. Harry added, I will bug you and you will appear in my supermarkets dressed as if you were just a poor man in the same situation I was in years ago. And let's see how they behave. The lawyer was at a loss for words. The idea seemed like something out of a movie, but he knew the businessman had enough resources to make it happen. He realized he had never done an undercover job like this, but it might be a simple task. Come on, Watson, I'll give you a bonus to match, Harry finished. Eight days later, Watson Goldstein woke up and, once again, did not shave. He wanted to leave it as it had been for a week, imperfect. He didn't put on a suit either. Instead, the lawyer put on the oldest boots that Harry found in a thrift store, a worn shirt, and ragged pants. As he put the microphone under his shirt and ensured it worked, he was nervous because his client would be in a car in the store parking lot, listening to everything. Finally, he grabbed a cane to complete his new character. Watson looked in the mirror and noticed that he looked like what most people on the street would call a bum, but in fact, he was dressed to try to find someone to take over Harry Melville's business. Although Harry had six supermarkets in the town where Watson lived, there were only three. So Watson decided to start with the unit in the city's center, the flagship store, which served as a model for other regional markets. It was a modern supermarket with digitally controlled temperatures, and sometimes a classical pianist played live from the second floor. Watson tried his best to look sad when an employee approached him. The girl asked if he was okay, and the undercover lawyer thought at that moment that his task would be completed faster than he'd assumed. He told the clerk that he was hungry and needed help in any way that she or the famous grocery store could provide. The girl then told him to wait and walk down the aisles of the fruit and vegetables. Watson thought he had gotten it right on the first try. After all, the girl seemed helpful. But disappointment came quickly and hard. When the girl returned, she was with an enormous security guard who grabbed the man by the arms and led him to the door. I thought you were going to help me, but you're kicking me out. I didn't do anything wrong, Watson said. The employee replied that she was only following orders and that she could do nothing. She had to care for the customers who might actually buy something. The staff here is rude and uncaring. What a shame, thought Harry as he heard everything from the car and watched his lawyer being shooed out of the back door of the supermarket. So Watson and Harry drove to the second market they had in town. Although it wasn't the most modern or fancy, it was the biggest. Who knows if maybe there won't be a greater diversity of character around here, huh? Harry thought. But he was wrong. It took longer for Watson to be noticed by anyone working there. As he passed through the food aisles, he approached some customers saying how hard life was and how high the prices were. Some customers simply pretended that the man in the worn clothing wasn't talking to them. Others would pay attention at first, but would make any excuse to get on with their lives, not caring for him. In fact, Watson didn't need help, of course. But he had put himself in that position, and as much as he was playing a role, it hurt his heart to be ignored like that. He was the only person in the area dressed like that, and he knew the outcome would have been different if he had been wearing one of his suits with his gold cufflinks and perfectly coiffed hair. Regardless, he noticed that a security guard was watching him. He had walked up just two aisles when a manager approached him and asked, Sir, do you need any help? Are you going to buy something? Watson replied, My dear man, I need to feed my children today. I have been unemployed for three months now. Can you help me? The manager said that the place was not an NGO or charity foundation and that he would have to leave immediately before other customers felt inconvenienced. But the disguised lawyer insisted, I'm an old friend of Mr. Melville. I was employed at the gas station next to his first supermarket. Harry has always been a wonderful, hard-working man with a modest upbringing. If you explain my situation to him, I am sure he will assist me. At that moment, the manager let out a mocking laugh, looked at the man in front of him and said, Hard worker? That old man was lucky that the neighborhood grew up around his store. Then, with money, it was easy to expand the business. The only person who really works hard at this company is me. Harry would never have expected such a reaction. Hearing everything from inside the car, he refrained from firing the manager at that very moment. Yet, at the same time, he felt ashamed for putting the lawyer through such humiliation. After all, what kind of supervisors would hire such heartless people? Watson then left the building, escorted by the manager, while all the customers watched the scene. Harry saw his lawyer walk through the exit door and realized that this mission was much more complex than he had assumed. He had little hope of his plan succeeding now, but there was still one more supermarket to visit, which was the smallest of the three and was located farther away from the center. 
Harry rarely visited that unit and knew only that many of the employees there came from the suburbs. Watson Goldstein played his role one last time, entering the place in worn clothes. He walked straight to the butcher shop. Hello, sir. Have you placed your order yet? said one of the employees. No, I didn't. I don't think I can afford it, but I'm hungry, he replied. Oh no, another beggar? I'm going to call George to get you out of here now, said the employee, threatening to call security. I did nothing. I'm just hungry. The man responded curtly, saying that he had work to do and that the plight of a bum like him was none of his business. But sir, Watson attempted to say, but was cut off by another employee. Don't worry, Mr. Duane. Let me take care of this, he told his boss. I'll put this man in his place. As the lawyer in disguise walked toward the door, the young clerk accompanied him. Sir, please tell me what you want, said the young man to Watson. The tag on his uniform indicated his name was William Long, and he appeared to be in his early 30s. Young man, I am hungry. I'd be grateful for anything you or this place can do for me. The boy said, come with me. So he took the man through the grocery store. Watson was ready to go out the door again, but William took him to an area where the employees ate their meals and gave him a sandwich, a slice of pizza, and a glass of juice. Someone finally helped Watson. Sorry about Duane, sir. This is a very nice market, and I'm sure nobody here wants anyone to starve, but we have some managers who are so eager to please our supervisors that they forget how to treat a real person, William said. Watson looked at the food before him and decided he would not waste the boy's efforts, but as he chewed, he let a tear run down. Is everything all right, sir? William wanted to know. Watson answered yes. He was just thrilled, as it had been two days since he had a decent meal. William had been the first to help him. This is a big market here, and one of the good ones, you know? They allowed me to work, which helped me a lot. And our kitchen prepares many things, but if they aren't sold the same day they are made, they go to waste. So I think it's okay if you take advantage of that, the boy said. When the lawyer was done eating, the young man led him to a back door so the beggar could leave without being seen. Sir, I have to get back to work. If I lose this job, I'm screwed, the young man said, and then he left. Watson thanked him for lunch and hoped he would not cause a problem for the young man, but William was at peace with what he did. That night, Harry Melville tried to relax by taking a long shower. He then called his human resources manager. He asked for full files on two employees, the manager of the flagship supermarket and a regular worker named William Long. He then laid down, tiredness taking over his body. Once again, he felt like an orphaned and misunderstood teenager who no one thought would have a future, which hurt him badly. When he awoke, he shaved, dressed in a suit, put on his expensive watch, and applied one of his French perfumes. He checked his phone and saw that the files for William and the manager had arrived. Everything in the manager's file was obvious and boring. So instead, Harry dug deeper into William's file. He was 28 years old and had lost his mother when he was 15. He began working in a carpentry shop to help his father pay the household bills. The young man passed the entrance exam at 19 and started at his business school. By then, he was working at a pharmacy and rushing to catch the bus to college after work. Unfortunately, he could only study until the third year because his father became very ill and had to stop working. William dropped out of business school at that point and began working odd jobs at night. He spent the rest of his time caring for his father. He'd worked at the supermarket for two years, trying to save enough money to return to school and realize his dream of starting his own business. After reading all that, Harry Melville made up his mind. He had found his successor. That same day, the arrogant manager was called into Mr. Melville's office. He was sure that he would be promoted. He entered the office with a smile and left disconsolate. He had been fired. William was called in shortly after and almost fell backward when he noticed that right next to the millionaire was the man he had helped the day before, but now he was clean and dressed immaculately. William began to tremble, unsure of what this meant. Harry asked him to calm down. After all, he was there to be promoted to manager, taking the position that the former manager had lost. With the promotion, he would be able to go back to school. Also, William's working conduct would be the standard for all units from that point on. Harry did not say a word about him being his successor. The eccentric Sir Harry Melville passed away three years later. Watson Goldstein called William to Harry's office, where he gave the boy a letter. By reading it, the new manager discovered he was in charge of the whole chain of supermarkets. The young man was stunned. I hope you accept this challenge and are pleased with the surprise, the letter said. I grew up without a father or mother, so I could have become a person like the one you chose to help and feed three years ago. That day, your attitude made me feel loved. Please do not change. Keep being yourself taking business seriously, but people even more so. I wish you happiness and good luck finding your successor one day. After finishing the letter, William wiped a tear from his face, looked out at the sky through the office window, and thanked Harry in silence. If you like this story, please leave a thumbs up, and this other video on the screen will also move you. Good session, and I'll see you in the next video.